where we worship together as a family of faith. Today I would like to wish the fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, father figures, a happy Father's Day. I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you. In just over a week, um, the, our hampers go out. I think I have enough um, drivers um, to deliver them. Uh, and I was telling a few people, uh, we're only delivering 17 hampers. Um, I wanted to do uh, 20 or, or more, but I made several phone calls and uh, the family said, we're okay. And so I just, uh, one lady said, I'm really sorry, but we're, we don't need it right now. And I said, I said you couldn't have uh, done more to make my day. I said, that's wonderful news, and we're very, very happy for you. And so we have three or four families that are doing better. And I think that, you know, we can, uh, a little bit of, of that, uh, we can attribute to our support of the families in this region. So we will still be doing the hampers on the, the 25th, however, and we'll still be doing them at Christmas as well. And today is also birthday Sunday. Carl Pritchard celebrated a birthday last week. <laughs> and today, my goodness, coming to church on your birthday, Alice Kennedy. So happy birthday to both of you. And let's sing birthday for you, Mr. Thank you. 
light, the light of Christ, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. We will read the call to worship responsibly. Wait for God who deals gently with us. Watch for God's appearance among us. In all times and places, we can rely on God. We can know God's steadfast love here and now. We find hope and strength in God's power to redeem us. We give thanks for this good new day God has given us. The beautiful hymn is Voices United 236. Now thank we all our God.
God who is able, by the power of a great and gracious love, to strengthen us in our struggles, to exhilarate spirits that are exhausted, to foster faith and fellowship, to welcome us back when we have wandered, in gratitude of God's sure love and abiding concern, we offer our words of praise. Amen. Our next hymn is 337, and Voices United, Blessed Assurance. <laughs>
can't rip the paper today. United Church camps, but make them year-round. On a windy weekday morning in February, you might expect a camp to be quiet, anxiously awaiting the hustle and bustle that summertime will bring. But on the escarpment in Lincoln, Ontario, Cave Springs Camp is anything but quiet. A nature school for youth operates daily on the lower floor of the new conference center. Staff take bookings for weddings, corporate events, and birthdays. And in the afternoon, a youth group will arrive to enjoy the year-round facilities. Cave Springs Camp hasn't always been this way. Not so long ago, programming would only run in the summertime, with some bookings into the fall if the weather permitted. Program Director Lance Wright enthusiastically expresses his deep gratitude for the people who have made year-round facilities and programs possible. Looking outside on a February weekday, Lance can see children at the nature school experimenting with the wind instead of hiding from it indoors on a phone <laughs> or a computer. Lance's passion for creating lifelong memories and inspiring faith and self-confidence shines through his work to build a caring and dynamic community atmosphere. From the vibrant colors of spring to the warm sunshine of summer, the crisp air of fall, and the magical snow-covered landscapes of winter, Cave Springs Camp provides an ever-changing backdrop for people of all ages to appreciate outdoor adventures and activities. Your generosity through mission and service is helping children, teens, and adults to reconnect with nature at any time of the year. Thank you so much. <coughs>
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself 
nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so there will never be, so there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you long life. Let us pray. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. Well, perhaps this is the most perfect prayer I have ever read. I'm not entirely sure if the circumstances are true, but it makes a lovely story nonetheless. And what is even better is this prayer came out of the mouth of a six-year-old boy. Here is the story. Mother and son were at a local swimming pool, and the son was standing at the deep end, his little toes curled over the edge. Still unsure of himself in the water, he stood there for what seemed to his mother like a very long time. Hesitated, mediated palpitating, and just when it seemed that he was going to back away from the edge, he looked up to the sky, put his hands together, and said, Oh Lord, give me skills or give me gills. <laughs> and he jumped. Give me skills or give me gills. That pretty much covers all the bases, doesn't it? Oh Lord, give me what I need to overcome what I am facing, but if you won't do that, give me what I need to endure it. Give me skills or give me guilt. Now I don't even remember when or where I found this little prayer, but it sits on a piece of paper in my desk drawer and I've referred to it many times. I suppose it might be surprising how many times I've looked at it, but maybe it shouldn't be. In a description about Christian life, I read, Your calling is not primarily to accomplish something, but to serve God, who will always lead you to places where you are in, way over your head. I think this reminds us that God has a habit of tossing us into the deep end of life. Oh Lord, give me skills or give me gills. Our reading from Kings finds Solomon in way over his head. His father is dead. He is now the head of his family. He's grieving. He's afraid. He's carrying a heavy load. He's no longer swimming in the safety of the shallow end of his childhood. With one swift toss, Solomon is headed into the deep end of adulthood. And what a deep end it was. It isn't just the loss of his father that Solomon is forced to confront, it's who his father was. His father was David, the great king of Israel, the slayer of Goliath, the liberator from the Philistines, the original raider of the lost ark, the unifier of the tribes, the master musician and wordsmith, the man after God's own heart. So with David's death, Solomon not only took his place at the head of his family, but he was now the head of the kingdom as well. Ready or not. And it was clear that Solomon was not ready. But he should have been, right? I mean, for years, Solomon had known that this day would come. 
His whole life was a preparation for the day that he would become king. And yet when the day does come, Solomon seems totally unprepared for it. The author of our story is kind to Solomon when he writes, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the, st in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. That is some kind of caveat. The second half of that sentence certainly seems to bring into question the first half. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only, well, he didn't, and he wasn't. We know this because shortly before his death, David calls Solomon to his bedside and tells him it won't be long until he becomes king. And David then gives his son some final words of advice. Making sacrifices and burning incense at the high places was definitely not on that list. I think what the author is trying to tell us as gently as possible is that while Solomon tried to follow in his father's footsteps, it was clear that he was very definitely not his father. He was, in fact, a mess. He was in way over his head. But the good thing, the saving grace, if you will, was that Solomon knew that he was in over his head. And when confronted with it, he fesses up to it. An even better thing is that even when he has forgotten or just abandoned the way to God, God finds a way to him. God finds Solomon in Gideon, where he has gone once again to make more sacrifices and to burn more incense, even though he knew better. There is a perfectly logical reason, I think, why Solomon would be so devoted to worshipping in the high places a reason that has nothing to do with his faith or the lack thereof. You see, by doing so, Solomon buys himself some time. It would take quite a while to offer 1,000 burnt sacrifices, days, I would guess. At the very least, it was time-consuming, and as long as Solomon is worshipping in the high places, he doesn't have to get about the difficult task of being the king of following in his father's footsteps. He doesn't have to make the leap into the great unknown. He can stay at the safe, shallow end of life. It's the perfect disguise, really, as people see what he's doing as an act of deep devotion, when in reality he's doing it out of fear. It looks to all the kingdom that Solomon is constantly running to God for help, when it's really the opposite, he's constantly running away. But lucky for him, even Solomon can't run in his sleep. And that's where the Lord finds him. The Lord appears to Solomon in a dream and asks him what he wants. But it's a dream, and because there's no one else listening in or looking on, Solomon is able to unburden his heart to God. In the words that we just heard from 1 Kings, Solomon is saying, in effect, I'm not up to this, God. You put me in the place of my father, but I'm not my father. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm scared to death. Then Solomon tells God what he wants. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this, your great people? Well, it's a prayer, really. Oh Lord, give me what I need to overcome what I'm <coughs> facing. But if you won't do that, give me what I need to endure it. In other words, oh Lord, give me skills or give me gifts. And the Lord gives Solomon both. The Lord answers, because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. It came to pass just as the Lord had said, and King Solomon is still known today for his wisdom, for his understanding mind, 
which is, I must admit, something of a shame. You see, for unless you know how Solomon acquired that wisdom, you might think that he was born with it. We know differently. It was a gift. The only thing Solomon knew was that he didn't know anything about being king. And come to find out, that was the only thing he needed to know. If God is constantly leading us into places where we are in way over our heads, then this story about Solomon is an important one. It means we can relax. Or if not relax, then it means we can at least stop pretending that we have everything under control. It means we can stop wasting time and energy on our own high places, our own personal givings, pretending to be something or someone we are not. It means we might as well stop running away from God because God's going to find us anyway. It means that when we realize all that we cannot do, we are in a perfect position to discover all that God can do. It means that if we cannot avoid the challenge set before us, if we're headed into the deep end sooner or later, one way or another, we should ask God for what we need to overcome it or what we need to endure it. We should boldly pray for skills and for gifts confident that God will always give us one or the other. <coughs> However the answer comes, God always comes with it. And that, as Solomon discovered that night in Gibeon, is the very best news of all. Thanks be to God. Preparation for prayer, let us turn to 348 in Voices United. We will, uh, oh love how deep, we will serve and sing verses 4 and 7. Please remain seated. to be in mission 
and to serve others according to the example of Christ. Broaden our vision to see beyond the limits of our own ideas and allegiances and make us more sensitive to the needs of others so that we can be a genuine source of help. We are called to evangelism as we pray that the power of Christ will be felt among all those who are searching in their faith. Let us be generous in the offering of our love, our friendship, and our care, so that Christ may be proclaimed through us. We are called to an educational ministry, to serve the needs of our children and youth as they seek to know your word and live by it. We are called to a ministry of stewardship as we offer our time, our talent, and our resources to the work of your kingdom upon the earth. Let us glorify your name in all that we do and return our thanks for your many gifts unto us. Send us into the world, O God, to be your church in Jesus Christ, and for each of us to be his disciples. Let us offer the bread of life and the living water to all who hunger and thirst for your sake. We ask this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 12, for more voices. Come touch our hearts.
Now as we go from this place, let us know the steadfast love of our God, the wisdom and the teachings of the risen Christ, and let us be guided in all that we do by the Holy Spirit. But as we go, let us remember that we never go alone.